When there's a discussion about who goes to university, someone, whether they're for or against widening access, will often play what seems to be a trump card. University isn't for everyone, they say. Well, my starting point today is that it may be true that our current system of higher education isn't for everyone. But I think that that says more about that system than it does about the people who are currently excluded. So I want to pose a question. Can we imagine a different higher education system? In the summer of 1904, Elizabeth Brown, who was known in her family as Lizzie, traveled from Belfast to Dublin for her graduation ceremony. She was nearly 29, and she'd been studying for about 10 years by correspondence. She paid one pound to be enrolled in her final exams in English, French, and German literature. And then when she passed those exams, she paid two pounds to be admitted to the degree. Lizzie was my great grandmother. She was from a relatively poor family, but one where all five children were educated, including both of the girls and a boy called Alf, whose legs were paralyzed, and according to the family story, who was carried to school by his siblings. Lizzie went to Trinity College Dublin to collect her degree, but she couldn't have attended Trinity as an undergraduate because women weren't admitted to Trinity, ironically, until 1904, the year that Lizzie went there to collect her degree. So instead, she enrolled at the Royal University of Ireland. Um, but that wasn't a university like the one that we're sitting in today that had a kind of physical campus and where she could go along to lectures. Instead, she completed her whole degree by correspondence. So Lizzie was entering a system that wasn't designed for her. In fact, you could say she was entering a system that had been designed to exclude her. And it's tempting to hear her story as so distanced from us in time that it sounds almost like a kind of fiction now. Because who goes to university and on what terms has changed very radically in the UK in the last 100 years. Around the world, too, there are now an estimated 150 million students in universities. And yet, UNESCO and others estimate that who goes to university is still very often determined by wealth, by geography, by class, by ethnicity, and in some regions of the world, by gender. Just to give you a few examples of that, in Mexico, less than 1% of the indigenous population goes to university. In China, a child born in a rural area is seven times less likely to go to university than one of its peers born in a city or town. And here in the UK, things have perhaps changed less than we think. This is a map of Bristol, the city where I now live and work. And you'll see that this map is sort of divided between this big chunk of deep blue and this big chunk of deep red. Now, in the areas that are colored deep blue here, a very, very high percentage of the population goes on to higher education when they're 18. In some of those areas, it's almost 100%. In the deep red areas, a much, much lower percentage of the population goes on to higher education at 18. In some of those areas, it's as low as 1 in 12. And Bristol isn't alone in having these strangely divided communities within what is apparently one city. And there's another way in which, almost silently, our universities have been changing over the last decade. Universities are actually becoming a lot less flexible. There are a lot fewer students studying, like Lizzie did, part-time. Since 2010, there's actually been a massive drop in the number of part-time students in England. There are 61% fewer of them. And what's strange about that is that that change is happening just at the point where we know that the fourth industrial revolution is going to massively change the way in which we all work and the skills that are required in our jobs. 
By some estimates, one in three skills currently used in the workplace might be obsolete in the next 18 months, let alone in the ten, next 10 years. And yet, our university system provides fewer and fewer opportunities for us all to upskill and retrain. And as a consequence, we're also likely to see over the next 10 or 15 years a, an increasing gulf between those who have the education that means they can access a high-skilled, highly paid profession and those who are left behind economically because they can't. So what alternatives do we have to this higher education system that we've built? Well, I think we can imagine a different system of post-18 education, one that would bring together further and higher education. And I'm going to start us off with just four proposals for how that system could be different. The first is that I think we should set a really ambitious goal. I think we should be aiming for full participation in further and higher education for everyone over the age of 18. But that shouldn't mean everybody goes to 18 and study full time. It should mean that everyone drops in and out of education throughout the course of their lives. And that leads to my second proposal, which is we need a system that's properly lifelong, in which it becomes the norm to study part-time like Lizzie did while you're working, while you've got caring responsibilities, while other things are going on in your life, and to come back in and out of education at different times. To make that work, we need my third proposal, which is we need to make universities much more accessible. So, I think that we should say that for the first six months, let's say, six months equivalent full time, university would be free and people could enrol regardless of their prior qualifications. This might seem like a crazy experiment and it was certainly called that when the Open University tried doing completely open access model 50 years ago. But we now have that model and many others that show that that can work. And my fourth proposal is that communities need to be much more involved in setting the priorities of universities. So I think that half of the higher education budget should be devolved to each region, and that there should then be what's called a participatory budgeting process, where local communities would be involved in working with universities to set the priorities for the coming year, or five years, or 10 years, so that the urgent questions and priorities emerging in those communities become part of what universities are thinking about. Now, I've given you my four proposals, and you might notice that I've just sort of glided past that small issue of university funding. Um, and of course, the issue of how we fund universities is hugely important. Personally, I favor replacing tuition fees with something like a modest participation tax, which I think would be fairer and more sustainable as a way of funding universities. But regardless of, of which system of finance you favor, it's worth remembering that tuition fees were often justified on the basis that who goes and who benefits from universities should pay. So think about the way in which we could recharge that rather stale debate about how we pay for universities if we completely change who participates from, in them and who benefits from them. Why does all of this matter? Well, I think this isn't just about universities. I think it's also about the way in which our societies now function. I think that we're living through what you might call a crisis in what forms of knowledge we hold in common as a society. And let me just give you a few examples of that, of, of what we think are likely to be kind of burning issues over the next two decades. We know that the rich are aging, but the poor are not. We know that technological change is going to accelerate over the next 10, 15, 20 years, but that there are whole sections of the population who are not included in that change. And we know that climate change may overwhelm all of us, but that some communities are particularly vulnerable. We live in increasingly divided societies, and in a sense, all of those three challenges I've just talked about are all crises of participation. How we face them will depend who has a say and a stake in what kind of future we build. Now, universities are critical in all of this, 
because they're at the forefront of trying to think about how we meet those sorts of challenges. But you can also make an argument that universities are partly responsible for the divisions that have grown up in our society. If you look at the last general election in the UK, at the EU referendum, and at the 2016 presidential election in the States, the single best predictor of how someone would vote wasn't age, it wasn't geography, it wasn't class, it was whether or not that person had been to higher education. Now that isn't a comment on how anyone voted or should vote, but it is a reminder that increasingly as a society, we're having at least two different conversations and struggling to hear each other across the divide. My first job as a teacher was in Anfield Primary School, which if any of you have been there is literally just underneath Liverpool Football Stadium. I wasn't there to teach the children though, I was there to teach a group of adults from their early 20s to their early 60s who were studying on an access course to go into higher education. That year that I spent teaching in Anfield has stayed with me and has shaped my sense of, of how we need to change the higher education system, of the need for it to be lifelong, and of the need for universities to be more present in communities like that one in Anfield, and like those ones that were colored a deep red on that map we saw a moment ago, where at the moment universities are pretty much invisible. But the other thing that that year taught me is just how much universities are currently missing out on. One of the kind of joys of the adult education classroom is the way in which academic expertise is met with and tested against all sorts of different kinds of other authority and particularly life experience. So I turned up in that classroom fairly sure that I could say to my students what I thought were kind of facts about Shakespeare's Othello, which we were reading. I'd tell them something that I thought was a fact about marriage or friendship or envy in Othello. And my students would be pretty happy to tell me that based on their experience, they thought I was wrong about friendship. And they were pretty sure that Shakespeare was wrong too. <laughs> now, take that example just of studying literature and think about the way in which university debates would function differently when you take an issue like cyber security, if you put the academics who are working on that really sensitive issue in contact at the beginning of their research projects with communities who have very good reason to be suspicious of surveillance culture, or communities that are very vulnerable for one reason or another to cyber crime. Or then think about doing the same with something like climate change, or doing something the same with how we think about the distribution of wealth. This kind of model would really mean universities working much more closely with society on the challenges of the future. And I'm not claiming that we would then magically have a utopia in which we would all agree with each other. But what you might find is that we would find different ways of hearing each other and living with the consequences where we disagree. I began today with that phrase, university isn't for everyone. And in some ways I may have just given you more evidence that our current university system isn't for everyone. I hope I've shown too, though, that it's possible to imagine a different kind of system, and that more than that, it's urgent and necessary that we do that if we're to build a society that has a shared future. And for that reason, I want to finish today where I also began, but to turn the question over to you. Can you imagine a different higher education system. Thank you.